So the Donate are now the reformers. There's some of those reformer stepchildren that the Donatists or the Neo-Donatists were called. And I know we've went kind of in the future, but we're going to go back into the past when we're done with this kind of sacral society teaching because I thought it was interesting because he calls it the first, you know, the first workings of that Reformation type, type spirit that would, would come in history. And we have a lot more information on the Donatists, and that's why we're, we're spending a lot more time with them than we are other groups. The other group that we will spend a, a tremendous amount of time with will be the Waldensians. Now, I would anticipate the Waldensians, I would anticipate spending a year at least on them. It could be longer. It could be two years. But we will be on the, the Waldensian period a long time because so much took place, and we have so many records and so much information about what they had done and what they had been through that in Baptist, in ancient Baptist history, it's one of those things that we have to understand. We've got to get a good concept and understanding of what those people went through because that's how you trace the Lord's churches. You find them like that, and you trace down what information you have now. We're going kind of into the future here of the Reformation to talk about the Donatist impact, So just to get it right so you understand that. So there, those Donatists that were in that time, the Neo-Donatists or those that were kind of uh, the Reformers' stepchildren, so to speak, they came out, just reminding you, they came out against the, the Constantinians or the, ref, the Reformers, Calvin and Luther and those guys, because they said, well, you guys didn't go far enough. Because once Calvin and Lutheran got their freedom to do what they want to do from the Pope and they built up power and everything else, then they persecuted the Anabaptists, the Donatist type people. They persecuted those. They, they were like the Reformers' stepchildren that were persecuted in that sense. The charge, uh, so in 1519, Martin Luther began to write against the frightful abominations of the Babylonian harlot and to disclose all her wickedness. Yes, as this was thunderclaps to bring it all down, but as soon as he joined himself to the secular rule, seeking protection there against the cross, then it, then it went with him as with a man who in mending an old kettle only makes the hole bigger. And he raised up a people altogether callous in sin. So there wasn't the same holiness that would be in a New Testament church pattern as in a sacral society, where a sacral society was set up as a whole community of people, and that was the church to those people, Augustine, city of God. The charge lodged with many variations was that the reformers had begun well, but had spoiled their beginning when they reverted back to the medieval pattern of things. The reformers said the stepchildren had fallen back to the beast, that is, the Romish school, which now they defend. The kingdom of God, which had previously come to them, they have again cast away. Now there were two papal systems, an old one and a new. Both of them opposed to the stepchildren for the same reason, namely the latter rejection of Christian sacralism. So Baptists would reject that Christian sacralism right away. That sacral society, that city of God, that everybody in Northfield's the church type mentality. They rejected that. Why? Because they knew that wasn't that wasn't the biblical model, and they would not they would not condone that. They wouldn't they wouldn't accept it. It was the it was the coalition of reformers with the arm of flesh that grieved those who came to be treated as stepchildren. One by one, modern investigators have come to see this. They would have nothing to do with the state church, and this was the main point in their separation from the Lutherans, the Zwinglians, and Calvinists. This was the one conception on which all parties among them were absolute accord. The real issue was on the question of the type of church which should take place, which should take place the place of the old church. The real issue was a bitter and irreconcilable battle between two mutually exclusive concepts of the church. Luther stopped short of a full reformation, content to walk hand in hand with the state, bogged down halfway between Catholicism and New Testament church organization. That's basically what happened. While the radicals were defecting from Luther, the Swiss reformer Zwingli was having very similar troubles. At the outset, Zwingli had been intimate with the people who later opened the Second Front. He had, in fact, to quite an extent shared their views, a fact to which the stepchildren were not slow to point. He had, for example, in that infant baptism ought not to be. Then came the moment which the city council let it be known that all contemplated reformers in the religious area had to be officially proved by them first. To this, Swingley submitted, 
And it was at this moment, very precisely, that the radicals began to peel off. One of the first mutterings of the storm that was brewing was the remark made by one who would soon function as a leader among the stepchildren. You have no business giving these decisions into the hands of the civil power. So this would be, this is what we hear in the New Testament by the apostle Peter when he is, when he is taught, when he is taken and they said, you know, we commanded you not to speak in this man's name. And he said, we would obey God rather than man. So the church, and this is what John Leland said. This is what John Back is, or Isaac Back has said. This is what uh, all of these, these Baptists that founded Rhode Island, uh, John Clark and all them, that Roger Williams, that it is not for the government to make decisions for the church. It is ne- the two are never supposed to be connected. They are never supposed to be. This marked not only the beginning of the tension, it also pinpointed the conceptual area in which it occurred, namely that of the nature of the church and the relationship in which it stands to society as such. Again, it was the question that had been in the minds of the Donatist, the same instance, insistence that the independence of the church in regard to the magistrate must be preserved at all cost. This is what Baptists hold to. True Baptists hold to that. I'm reminded of, of I, I keep watching these videos that come up, and I know it doesn't sound very nice, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I see these videos of Jack Treber sending out videos that he's at Golden State Baptist Church, or Golden State Baptist College, sorry, and I forget the name of the church. But anyway, um, what is it again? West Coast? North Valley. North Valley. North Valley Baptist Church. Okay, so North Valley Baptist Church, West, it's uh, Golden State College. North, North Valley Baptist Church, and he's like begging the governor to open the doors up and let us go inside. And, all, and, and I see these videos, and I'm watching them, and I'm like, it's totally foreign to what Baptist would ever stand for or deal with in, this, in, this, uh, in America before. I mean, we dealt with it with the reformers and the Puritans that tried to lock us out of buildings and steal our buildings and everything else like that. But we didn't beg them. We didn't stand there. We're begging that these people for the liberty that we already have. And it was a folding due to money. That's what it was. That's, that's, that's the 501c3. That's the mentality. So they ask the government to let them open their churches. They begged them so that they could have an Easter service. There ain't no way in this world I'm begging that governor of Minnesota to have any service at all, period. No way. We are going to the state and asking them for permission to operate. But see, that's that's when you have the wrong setup, when you're organized wrong, and when you practice wrong, and when you've already submitted to the government in so many other areas, you have no dog in the fight. You have nothing to stand on because you've already folded. You've already accepted their government goodies. Yes, they bought you. Yeah, so now they, now they, want, they want you to comply, right? That's what they want. Right. Tell me why that church doesn't go in some go, go rent some field somewhere. Some big, huge field, put big, huge tents up, blow heaters up, and have thousands of people anyway there. Why not? I'll tell you why. Because you think your building is, is more important. That's why. And you know what? Most of those people wouldn't do it. Most of them wouldn't show up. That's why. That's just the way it is. Well, they've been conditioned, and they've been conditioned to follow it. You know? Right. Exactly. We don't contend for a building. We'll go meet somewhere else. If you want this, you can have it. Take it. I don't care. Take it. All it is is brick and mortar. You can have it. You can't meet there. Okay, bye. See ya.
Ja, ja. That, that the nature of the church and the relationship in which it stands to society is such. Again, it was the question that had been in the minds of the Donatists in the same instance that independence of the church in regard to the magistrate must be preserved at all costs. Just as in the eyes of the Donatists, the church had disgraced itself when it accepted the flirtations of the emperor. So did the Neo-Donatists frown upon the reformers for letting themselves be seduced by the same siren voice, the same flirtations. Not much has changed, has it? That's... I mean, that's the way it is. The flirtations to which we refer ended in a marriage. Think about that. What do you mean a marriage? Well, when a church is, a bride, is the bride of Christ, right? It has one head over it. Who's that head? Christ. Christ. So who is she married to? Who is she espoused to? I've espoused you to one husband. one husband, Christ. Right? So then it would be like, it would be like if your wife started confiding in another man, started asking that other man to do things for her, Receive money from that other man, benefits from that other man, but said I, but had no physical. Well, look, I'm. We still love. I still love you, but he does all this stuff for me. How would you feel about that? Besides wanting to kill him, <laughs> right? Other than that, right? Well, that's what they're doing to the Lord. And that's what the Donatists understood. That's what they got. And that's why they were hated. So it ends up in a marriage. They're married to the state. The flirtations to which we refer ended a marriage. It was this marriage that put in the status of stepchildren those who had hitherto walked with the reformers, but who had resisted stubbornly the coalescence of the church and state. Whether the marriage was one of convenience, we shall not attempt to say. That it was diplomatically wise is, of course, evident. It made it possible for the reform, which would otherwise in all likelihood have been choked in its own blood and dispatched at the Hussite reformer, Reform had been dispatched to have a future, but by it the ancient sacralist system, armed to the teeth with military might, available to it on a moment's notice, was challenged by a rival sacralist system. Likewise, backed up by a sword of steel, but from the principal point of view, the marriage was a catastrophe for, a catastrophe for it made inevitably the, perpe the perpetuation of all evils that had been spawned by the Constantinian change as one of the first to attempt an objective study was uh, C.A. Cornelius. He said this, As correct as this step taken by Zwingli was from the point of a, the view of the state, however much it was calculated to give ecclesiastical endeavors greater dignity and status. It was a bad step from an evangelical point of view, one that was certain to lead to contention and schism in the party. So what happened? The same thing with Constantine. All of them do it. Calvin wanted to be king. Zwingli wanted to be king, and they persecuted those that would not accept them. They merged that state concept together, and then they taught the mixture of the two together. Well, when the Donatists weren't on board, well, guess what? When you have the power of the sword, somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to die. That's how it works. So what did Zwingli do? Well, first he was against infant baptism, but then when he made his merger with the state, his agreement that, that all, all, all ministers must be licensed in, and, and follow the state. Then when Zwingli did that, then guess what happened? He changed. He no longer said infant baptism was wrong. He accepted and adopted infant baptism, and Felix Mons and the other, I believe it was, and the other men that were there, because I think I read that. I don't see it. The history of the Baptists in somewhere by Burrage. 
B-U-R-R-A-G-E, I don't know where it is. But anyway, uh, the Swiss Baptist, I think it was, or something like that. But anyway, once, once they merged together, then he just started killing those people. And if you came back in, his own friend, a reformer, he killed him. Yep. Of the momentous development, the marriage of which we have spoken, a present-day student of Re Reformation history has said so very correctly. The product of the development from October 1523 to January 1525 was the rejection of Corpus Christianum. Following the revolutionary change in the relations of the church and the world, which we associate with the names of Constantine, Theodosius, Augustine, medieval Christendom had no room for the biblical concept of the world. The consequences for ethics, for a doctrine of the church, for evangelism, and for eschatology were revolutionary and yet hardly noticed. So conscious and, conscious and so all-pervading was the acceptance of the identity of church and society that the reformers, each working closely with the local magistracy and seeking to reform medieval Catholicism with, that little, with as little commotion as possible, were not even aware of a problem and were able to pass off as a political revolutionaries those who raised the question. So they turned, like the Anabaptists and those people, they said, well, you're just political revolutionaries. That's all you are. You guys just want to cause trouble. That's what you're doing. You're just political revolutionaries. That's what you are. That's what they said. So they could dismiss them, right? And they could, they could dismiss them and act like they weren't real. In the eyes of the Donatists, whether early Donatists or late, the church had fallen in the days of Constantine with a fall as calamitous and as fraught with evil consequences as the fall in Eden. This fall had made a fallen creature of the church, one dead in trespasses and sins, and just as the catastrophe in Eden had, much, had made a rebirth necessary, so did the fall of the 4th century require a new creation. So said the heretics. That's, that would be you. They felt... They felt called, therefore, to reconstitute the church to start all over. The medieval heretics may, therefore, be called restitutionists and their views restitutionism. Because the stepchildren fell heir to this assessment of the Constantinian change, they may likewise be called restitutionists. We shall do so and so fulfill a promise made in the introduction of this volume. They were doubly entitled to this term, for as they saw things, they were confronted with a twice-fallen church, once in the days of Constantine and now again in the days of the Reformers. See, everybody lifts these reformers up like they were great people. They were not. Did God use them and did some great things happen? Sure. But they persecuted Baptist people. And they persecuted people that held to this book and that did not want the state ruling over the church. See, the only thing that Luther and Zwingli and, all those and Calvin and those reformers wanted was to reform Rome. They liked the system. They wanted to change the doctrine. Right. They wanted to be their own pope. Because when they deemed it necessary to burn heretics, that's exactly what Calvin did. That's exactly what he did. At the outset, it must be confessed and granted that the first church of Christ and the apostles has in foregoing times been destroyed and laid waste by Antichrist, so that we do not need to waste many words or call in many witnesses, seeing that we to a man do know, as do all who call themselves evangelicals, that the entire papacy has become a Sodom. <laughs> Amen. He then goes on to describe the steps with which the restitutionists took in an effort to recover the erstwhile church. Since the reformers, as the restitutionists saw things, were now just as fallen as the papists, their reformatory program held forth no promise. So, let's see. First Timothy, turn there. Verse number four, or chapter four. Remember, we memorized these, didn't we? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. We memorized those, didn't we? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. What happened? This is exactly what happened. They were taken. They were consumed by spirits. And they were distracted. And they were subverted. And the reformers were subverted. It also says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, turn away which is exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to turn away from those men and be away from them and not, not, and not have their fellowship with them. The fall is a serious thing. The change that took place in the days of Constantine shook the ship from stem to stern. Nothing in the church's theology, its organization, its place in the world escaped the effects of the virus that had entered its bloodstream. Medication would have to be strong and in large doses. Moreover, let it be remembered that the, that the church which the men of the 16th century had inherited had borne the image of the Constantinian synthesis as well over a millennium when the Re Reformation began to happen. Hence, let no one underestimate the headlong daring of the radicals of Reform Reformation times. They were out to turn the world upside down. The world as it had stood it for so long a time that men could hardly imagine it had ever stood otherwise. Had it not been for the fact that the blueprints and the authentic church were still accessible in the New Testament, there would never have been any clamor for the restitution of it. See, when Constantine came into the church, he did not check his imperial equipment at the door. No, indeed, he came in with all the accoutrements that pertain to the secular regime. He was not just a Roman who had learned to bow to Christ. He had been Pontifex Maximus, hitherto the high priest of the Roman state religion. And he entered the church with the understanding that he would be Pontifex, Pontifex Maximus there too. See, that's what you have to understand. When you study Constantine and you study what happened with the Donatists, you have to understand that he entered as the head of the mystery religions, the priestly order, and the head of all governments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why they always called him the Antichrist. The Waldenses, everybody called him the Antichrist. Yep. Let's see. Here we go. All right, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 17 for your verses. We're going to start with verse 3 and go to verse 6, I believe. Constantine and his Romish system, we can see here. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head... And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. We'll, use, we'll do those verses there. He had been Pontifex Maximus hitherto, and he would be Pontifex 
Pontifex Maximus thereto. And just as his sword had flashed in defense of the old religion, so would it now flash in the defense of the new. This put a new and novel weapon in the hand of the Bride of Christ, the Sword of Steel. Now her battles could be fought in the fashion to which the Roman legions were accustomed. The impl implication was that he had come meek and lowly and riding upon a colt the foal of an ass would now come on a prancing war horse. See the difference? Almost incredible though it is, men do not seem to have noticed how grotesque this was. H had it not been for the Roman precedent, the change would have been unthinkable. They didn't notice what was happening because they weren't being killed anymore. Well, now they are being flattered to death, which the flattery, which is the tool of the Antichrist, is way, way worse than, than being martyred. It just is. It is true the grotesque of the new situation did it seem registered to a degree with those who promoted the change, and it registered enough to make them try to file down the rough edges. They invented the ridiculous fiction that the church did not really sacrifice her dignity when the emperor's sword flashed in her behalf, for it was the magistrate's man that actually drew the blood, even though it was on her behest. Out of the words of Peter, recorded in Luke 22, 23, Lord, here are two swords. The church distilled the ridiculous doctrine that Jesus intended his church to have two swords, the sword of the spirit, while the, which the clergy wields, and the sword of steel, which the soldier swings. By the year 1150, this formula of the two swords was already old, so old as to be unquestioned. Two swords belong to Peter. One is in his hand. The other is at his command whenever it was needful to draw it. Both the spiritual and material sword belong to the church. The latter sword is drawn for the church, the former by the church. One belongs to the priest and the other to the soldiery. But this one is drawn at the orders of the priest. By this colossal piece of sophistry, the church made herself believe that she could order the lifeblood of men to be let, all the while getting none of it on her skirt. The, this monstrous doctrine was put forth in dead earnest all through the medieval times. It is set forth in the Bull Unum Sanctum issued by Boniface in 1302. It remains the unrepudiated doctrine of the Catholic Church to this day. As that chief heretic Thomas Aquinas has, has it, the state through which earthly objectives are reached must be subordinated to the church. Church and state are two swords which God has given to Christendom for protection. Both these swords, however, are by him given to the Pope, and the temporal sword is then by the Pope entrusted to the rulers of the state. So, let's think about this for a second, shall we? Let's think about when we dropped some democracy on Iraq. What we do that for? Well, Iraq is also called Babylon. Guess where Nimrod was? The gateway to the gods. Yeah, remember Brother Bush? Right? Remember him? Stay the course, Bush. Remember, remember at the Alfred B. Martin dinner, he laughed about, which is a Jesuit dinner, by the way, where both sides come together, sit at a table. You can't make it up, man. You just can't make it up. And, and people still fall for the right-left paradigm, and it's right in front of their face. They all sit at a dinner, and they mock you. That dinner is not, that dinner is not for them to get along with each other it's to mock you and be like see this charade we're playing and you're all a bunch of dummies because you fall for it and give us millions of dollars dummies keep giving us billions of dollars you dumb dumbs and we just laugh at your stupidity while we laugh all the way to the bank because we're all on the same side hi look go look on it i dare you you'll quit voting for these idiots when you do it you'll just be like yeah whatever 
you guys are all on the same team. I mean, they sit at a dinner together and, and they're mocking. Oh, what about them WMDs I didn't find? <laughs> and they all laugh. Wait a minute. Like you literally, you literally killed all those people over there. And you're laughing about it. You sent armies over there and you killed those people. And you, and you killed our kids in the process yeah, yeah, on, and sent them to Afghanistan to guard your stupid poppy seeds so the Pope can have his drug money. Yeah. Is that too real for you? Yeah, real. Well, prove me wrong. I dare you. Yeah, Let's hear it. Because that's what they're doing. And so, so who is the sword of the government that does it? Well, it's the U.S. Army. We do it. We're, we're the sword of Babylon. We, we send it over there. I mean, we went over to, we're, what, what are you doing in Afghanistan? Garden poppy seed. Like, what are you doing over there doing that? Like, what, what, what would you do that for? And why would you, why would you drop, why, why would you go over there and, and take over Iraq? And why would you kill all those? Well, they're gassing their own people. Well, you're aborting all yours. What moral authority do you have? You don't even let them come out of the womb, you stinking devils. How about that? Is that too straight? Too straightforward? Or is it just absolutely too stinking real for people to take? Because I think it is. I think it's that, I think it's that duh thing that hits you in the middle of your head. Like, duh, how did I fall for something so stupid anyway? That all these people, all they want to do is just, they're starting wars, they're doing all this, and what for? And then they admit, well, there wasn't really any WMDs. Oh. And we just wanted to drop some democracy on them. And then you have Christians over there go, make them all glass, turn them all into glass. Get the moose lamb, kill them. Right. That's a good t-shirt. <laughs> What's that? And, but, but then to, then to force, forced amalgamation here into your culture. And that's why Faribo looks like little Somalia. Right? It's forced amalgamation. That's what it is. They, wait a minute. So do you feel like you got tricked? Well, yeah, you did. You, you got trumped. That's right. But you, but you did. You did because that's what they did. Wait a minute. I thought these were all like people that were. I mean, it was all. You mean like it would almost seem like that was planned. Like, I don't know. And I'm not the smartest guy. And I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I did learn when I was a kid. You remember Connect the Dots? I know you do. Dave, yeah. you got the same intelligence level as me. So you played yes. Connect the Dots. Yes, I know. I no, I okay. So you remember Connect the Dots, right? You know how that works. I know. I, I learned how to connect the dots when I was a kid. And see, that's pretty. That's right. That was for the, that was for me. But, but those those were mine. That you can see the outline to help me. But I could connect those dots, and I could see real quick. We got scammed, man. And that's that's the same thing. And people just don't get it. But there is a religious spirit behind it. By the way, that same president is the same one that his attorney general did invade IBT and did kick them out of their building. Brother Bush. The truth really hurts, doesn't it? It's very inconvenient, isn't it? Yes. The Constantinian change made short work of Jesus' words. My kingdom is not of this world. Else would my servants fight that I should not be delivered. It put Peter in the right for drawing the sword to promote the cause of it, and the cause, and it put Jesus in the wrong for rebuking Peter for it. If their interpretation is true, right, then Jesus was wrong to rebuke Peter because Peter was right to take out the sword and chop that dude's ear off. And let's get this kingdom kicked off right. Because you got to understand, like, the apostles, they were just like, let's go. Shing, let's get out of here. Let's go. It's wartime. They were ready. Let's get the kingdom. To Rome we go. Right? They're ready to go. And Jesus like, 
Uh-uh. First of all, I don't need your little sword. Because I can speak and they'll all die. And I'm going to one day speak and they're all going to fall apart. They're all going to burn up. Right. I just knocked them down when I spoke then, right? But when, I come, when Jesus comes back again, he says, no, when I come back with great power and glory, yeah, you're going to be with me on horses, but you ain't doing no fighting. It'll already be done. Right? But that's not the way they see it. The fallen church conveniently forgot that Jesus had been deeply displeased at the first suggestion of a second sword. It forgot that he had been so disturbed by Peter's rash act that he had stooped down to repair the damage Peter's sword had inflicted. It overlooked the fact that he had performed a miracle of healing, his last, to erase from the record the act so out of keeping with the work he came to do. The medieval church boasted of being in the signature of this Peter. Well, it was more like him than it knew. Nor was this doctrine of the two swords merely a piece of scholastic subtlety. It was said and meant in, de in dead earnest and practiced too. All through the medieval times, the heads of heretics rolled in all directions and the earth was dampened with the blood of men. The air abused with the smell of the roasting flesh of men. All in the signature of the Constantinian change. Caiaphas's Caiaphas servant. Caiaphas's nephew or something. Or something. You think he yeah. yeah, maybe he did. We're just not told. And at all times the priest stood by to see it that the secular power performed the gruesome assignment. In order to be able to live with herself, the church regularly begged the executioner to stop short of life and limb, a request that neither she nor he ever took seriously. The church would have been wholly embarrassed if anyone had taken this bit of window dressing seriously. To, credit of the, to the credit of the heretics, it may be said that they never fell for this pious double talk, never let the church proclaim with impunity the idea that because she did not actually draw the blood, she was not guilty of murder. The Waldensians said caustically, the priest actuate the secular arm and then think to be free from murder. And they wish to be known as benefactors. Yes, just as did Ananias and Caiaphas and the rest of, of the Pharisees in the time of Christ, so does innocent do in our times. They refrain from going into the house of Pilate lest they be defiled and in the meantime, in the meantime deliver Jesus up to the secular arm. Make sense? In other words, basically, here's what they did. Well, in that room over there is death, and I'm not going to go in that room, but I'm going to push you through the door. And that's what they did. That's what the Pharisees did. They said, it's not lawful for us to kill a man, but we'll hand him over to you and you can kill him. And that's what the priests did. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. They still do it. And they're still the Pharisees. And they still have the robes with the phylacteries. The horrible idea that the Church of Christ may move the wrist of the hand that holds the sword was, of course, carefully stated in the jurisprudence of the Middle Ages. None put it more succinctly than did a jurist of the early 16th century, Philip, Phillips Wieland, who taught that heresy is punished by fire. The spiritual judge tries the case and the secular judge performs the execution. Centuries earlier, the famous expert at law, Felipe de Bumanor, had put it this way and a bit more lengthy. He said this, if a lay person believes incorrectly, he is to be returned to the true faith by instruction. If he refuses to believe but adheres instead to his wicked error, then he shall be condemned as a heretic and burned. But in that event, lay justice must come to the aid of the Holy Church. For when anyone is condemned as a heretic by the examination conducted by the Holy Church, then the Holy Church must leave him to lay justice, and the lay justice must then burn him, 
seeing that the spiritual justice ought not put anyone to death. That is what we call Jesuit sophistry. What's well, exactly what happened in the New Testament? To Christ. What's that? That's what, happened. That's what they did to Christ, right? It's the same spirit. It's the Pharisees. Yeah. They're still doing it. Yeah. They couldn't shed the blood trail that their ministry was part of. Yep, they did the exact same thing. Such then was Christendom. The fall of the church had so changed the visage of the bride of Christ as to make her unrecognizable. She who had been sent on a mission of healing and helping had taken on the features of the modern police state. Uh oh. We take this comparison deliberately and seriously. The modern totalitarian state had added nothing new, not even that which we now call brainwashing. The medieval world was a world in which minorities were unwanted. It was a world in which the rights of speech and of assembly were, as we shall have occasion to see in the latter chapter, rigidly curtailed. Medieval society was the optionless society as optionless as any totalitarianism of our times. A small number of party members ran the entire show. The common man was completely and effectively defranchised. The parallel is frightening, as is the thought that in the areas where the medieval monolithic society has not been successfully challenged, the one totalitarian readily makes way for another. The one encouraging fact is that there was at all times, all through the Middle Ages, a sustained protest against the distortions that had come with the Constantinian change. And that this sustained protest finally and ultimately was able to blow apart the Constantinian Colossus. In and with this protest, the New Testament and its delineation of the Christian church remained a part of the heritage of man. So we'll stop there for now. Because we got a lot more to cover in this. And I'm, it's interesting to me. I, I, because, because of the design of it and what happened, I'm, I'm very interested in it. But we're, we'll finish it probably next week. Um, he says this, we'll close with this one. He says, The brutality and cruelty that accompanied the executions performed under the supervision of the fallen church were too frightful for words. We shall give, but leave untranslated, the public announcement that went with the execution of a certain stepchild named Michael. It was considered one of the lesser punishments to have the tongue pierced, a stick of wood thrust through it, and so to stand in the public square for an hour or so. It is understandable that men who knew the Christ of the New Testament should begin to speak of the church as fallen. The custom of, the exec of executing heretics by fire rather than by some other means seems to have come in connection with John 15, 6. If a man abide not in me, which was identified with not staying in the church, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. I was wondering, that was going to be my question. Where did they get that from? That's the distortion of the Bible. Because Jesus is speaking eternally there. He's speaking, of, he's speaking of their spirits. He's not speaking of burning their bodies. Right. Right. And they would call themselves angels. Messengers of God. Right. Mm -hmm. So next week we'll pick up right here and... Uh, you have your memory verses there, talking about Rome, that scarlet harlot. That's a good nickname. You can remember that one. That's a question for you. You can remember that one. What is Rome? What was Rome's nick? One of Rome's nicknames, the scarlet harlot. Right. Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. By the way, the mother of harlots, meaning she had children. Who are the harlots' children? Right. That's right. They are the harlot's children, the ones that hold the same sacral system, which that, in Constantine's time, that's what the Donatists fight. That's what they fought. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the liberty and freedom to assemble. And thank you that we can uh, be a church, Lord. Thank you that you have a church still and you always have had a church on this earth. Amen. Always those men that would stand and women that would stand outside, though they were persecuted grievously, that you might receive glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. <clears throat>